So I would like to welcome Dr. Haley Jacob, the 2023 Manili Visiting Scholar. There is information about her in your program, and to respect her time and yours, I don't see a need to read through that. But one of the things I find most fascinating about her is that she started reading the Bible at age 12 and loved it. And I just started reading the Bible. I was reading the Bible too at age 12, but I can't say that I loved it. So I'm really intrigued to hear from someone whose passion for our sacred scriptures began at such a young age and has continued through now. So Haley, Dr. Haley Jacob, I turn this over to you. Sorry, I got a little bit lost. I was reading what Mary wrote about me. <laughs> and, that, and I thought, is this true? Did I say that? It's true. I did um, start reading the Bible when I was 12. I was sharing with a few of you um, a bit earlier about how I, I would say I became a Christian at a Protestant youth camp when I was 12 years old. That was the first time that the gospel as... Protestants typically present it became clear to me. Uh, a kid who was raised in a Roman Catholic context and had been to more masses in my life than most, probably of all of you in the room. But um, so yeah, from that kind of age of 12, I had this insatiable desire to understand the Bible and to read it and to know it and and I'm grateful for that. It's something that God took and manifested in my life and grew, and obviously um, here I am teaching it um, in this context, but that is uh, just a gift that's been given to me um, as I think about my own faith journey. So uh, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you for coming tonight, those of you here in person, those of you uh, you know online. Um, this is a a gift for me to be able to be here. It's fantastic to be with other people, to see the bright shining faces. You're excited to learn something new. Uh, I didn't realize that this is the first time being back after three years of not having this, so I feel even extra honored in that way that I get to be that person um, after that three-year hiatus. So um, thank you for having me. Tonight we're going to go through this uh, question of the hope of glory and the question of, of what is it, when is it, and have we got it all wrong? Um, before doing so, I'll just give you a quick um, extra little intro piece. Uh, I am grateful to be back in Kansas City. The last time I was here, my mother confirmed, was 1993. The only time I've been here was 1993. And the only memory I have from that was getting lost at Oceans of Fun. <laughs> um, I was uh, 10 years old, and I got lost, and I had somehow the wherewithal to ask a security guard or, you know, cop or somebody to say, I lost my family, help me. My mother did the same, and I have this very vivid memory of, you know, walking over this hill with all the rides going to the left and the right and seeing her and then just breaking down, right? I'd hold, held my emotions together until that point, and then I saw my mom, and, you know, just the tears started flowing. So this is the only memory I have of <laughs> Kansas City previous to being here, so I hope there's no tears that come from this, this trip. Um, I'm from Minnesota originally, love the state of Minnesota, a very small town of about 600 people called Mazeppa, southeast corner of Minnesota, where I am the fifth generation. So I kid you not, in my cemetery, it is my cemetery, I can find the gravestones of my grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, and my great-great-great-grandparents who came from Luxembourg and Italy, met there, their family stayed there, and mine, they have never left until I left for Washington. Where I'm at, I teach at Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington. I've been there for eight years now and um, have bounced around from place to place between Minnesota and there, um, but I anticipate being in Spokane, Washington now for a very long while. While there, I... Whoop, I gotta go this way. <laughs> I, I don't know if this is gonna work. Nope. 
There we go. I met that very cute chappy right there to the left. That's Alan. And these are my babies, Brooks and Phoebe. So they're terrorizing my husband while I get to be here with all of you. Um, so that's just a little bit about, about me. Um, okay, so where we're going? We're going to, this is going to be hard to use, okay, where we're headed. Tonight we're going to talk about how we are created for glory. This is going to be part of our questions of what does it look like to experience glory? What is glory? So we're going to go to the beginning tonight, back to Genesis. On uh, tomorrow morning, we'll do first going to the question of what does redemption look like and being redeemed for glory. And then Saturday, suffering in glory, or the idea of a cruciform life, for any of you who have maybe heard that term before. The text that we're going to look at, and um, I'm realizing it's hard to read some of the yellow, so I maybe can change that for tomorrow. Romans 8, 28 through 30. Let me read it to you for those of you who are unable to see. It's a text I'm guessing all of you have at least heard in your life, and you may even have memorized part of it. So Romans 8.28 says, We know that God works all things together for good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many children, and those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the climax of the book of Romans at this point. If you're listening to a, a symphony or an orchestra, right, this is the moment when everything clashes. And there's a resounding sound that comes from that stage. This is that point in the letter of Romans. This was also the text that I focused on for my doctoral work. And so in some ways, I've been preparing to speak to all of you since 2011. I should have it down pretty well, right? <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, I love teaching and talking about these verses for many reasons. But one of the most important reasons that I chose these verses to look at for my doctoral work is when I started that process, I wanted to do some form of research that would impact the church. There are far too many doctoral dissertations or theses that are written and that are put on a shelf for maybe a handful of people who might care about them. Roger, is yours one of them? Hope not. I'm sure it's not. But there are many, many, many that are that way. And that gets you the degree, and that may get you the job, but I wanted to do something that would actually be of benefit and impact the church. I care deeply about the church. I care about what God is doing in the lives of his people and how they are then receiving that word from the Holy Spirit and taking it into the world. And as you've heard, I care deeply about the Bible. I've been interested in it since a young age. And so for me, these two things came together for addressing a text that has impacted the church in significant ways. What I focused on was this phrase in the middle that's in italics, which is to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, in the New Testament, that is one-third of one verse, which is a very short text to write an entire doctoral dissertation on. But when you open commentaries on this verse, here's the one thing that you find. Won't it be wonderful to be made like Christ? One day we will be all like Christ. Alleluia. When we die, we will be made to be like Jesus. 
at some point in our lives, God will conform us to be like the person and life of Christ. And I think, yes, absolutely. But what does that mean to be made like Christ? Is it his ethics? Are we somehow going to be as holy as he is? Is that what that refers to? Does it refer to his identity as the son of God? Does it refer to his ability to perform miracles? What does it mean to be made like Christ? Which has lots and lots of answers. And the other thing that you'd find in commentaries on this verse is they all say this is the goal of salvation. God has saved us, God has forgiven us in order that we might be made like Christ, that we might be conformed to the image of God's Son. That's the goal of salvation, according to many, many commentators, which, again, sounds really wonderful. It sounds holy and spiritual and all the things we like to think about. But... Is that actually what Paul, here in Romans, is referring to? So that's where we're going to go. Um, Before we do so, before we dive in, I want you to be my students. I get to be your teacher, and you get to be my students. So if you wouldn't mind, I would love for you to take a couple of minutes and answer for yourselves these three questions. Because here's what I've learned. You can't learn anything. You can't have your mind changed or realize something you thought might be off or be expanded unless you first know what you actually think. And in order to know what you think, you have to think about it. So. You have these note cards. Um, I would love it if you could use those. They're gonna be used for questions, so just take one side of it, perhaps, and perhaps write your name on it. Again, if you have a pen or pencil, great. If you need one, um, we have some that we can, can dispense. And I want you just to take a minute and answer these three questions, and ideally, you would do it in one sentence or key phrases. What is the goal of salvation according to you? Why are you saved? What's the goal? Why did God save you? Okay, second question. I know, and this is a rough one, right? What is the gospel in one sentence? If you're on a train and somebody turns to you and says, what's the gospel? I hope you have an answer. As God's people, we need to have an answer, but we often fumble around for one. And then glory. What is it and when is it? So just take, take a minute or two. And it doesn't have to be full sentences. It can just you know write the key phrases. You can leave out your, your um, smaller parts of the sentence. Once you've done that, the best that you can in this small space of time, now it gets harder. I want you to turn to a neighbor, whoever you came with, or even if you didn't, find somebody next to you and just share together what did you write. There's no right answer (laughs) at this point. (laughs) Just real briefly, real briefly. Okay. I'll stop you there. I know it's a very brief time. You didn't get a chance to share all you wanted to. It's okay. It's written down. Most of you are potentially sharing. Many of you are sharing with people you're going to go home with anyway, so you can keep sharing. For the sake of our time, though, I want us to continue. Again, why do we do this exercise? Because everything I'm going to tell you tonight and tomorrow morning is going to come back to these presuppositions. These are the heart of what I want us to think critically together about. We'll do glory tonight, at least the foundation of glory, and then tomorrow morning we'll come back to gospel and um, goal of salvation. Okay? So, you can just hold on to your, your whatever you wrote 
Um, and yeah. Okay, glory. Um, I'm going to guess, for those of you who had a chance to get to it, that you wrote something about the future. Maybe it takes place in heaven. I don't know what you wrote, but if I ask all of you to imagine in your mind's eye glory and our glory one day, what do you see in your mind? How do we visualize glory in our mind? The glory that we anticipate for ourselves. Most, I'm going to guess, have some form of vision that regards light. Yeah, I see some heads nodding. Is there light, illumination, brilliance of some kind? Um, do you want to do the next one? If you ask Google, <laughs> not the Google, but if you ask Google for images of glory, you get what many of you just imagined. Yes, some have the words, but the majority of them, and this is just a screenshot. I didn't somehow, you know, collect this one and that. I don't have the skills for that or the time. This is just a screenshot of images for glory that Google produced for me when I said glory. So glory is very much the sense of someplace up in the sky because that's often where heaven is imagined to be and that's the place that we might go to after we leave this earth and that's the point at which we are glorified which has something to do with us being in this luminous, visible manifestation of light around God and in the presence of God, right? Light. And we're caught up in that, and that becomes glory. When we are glorified, we're in the presence of the glory of God where it's this bright, shining light. Give me a nod of your head if you had some sense of that. Okay. Google at least thought so. <laughs> These are our Christian presuppositions. Google shares our Christian presuppositions in terms of it having something to do with light, something to do with the place where God is, which often we say God is in heaven, heaven is often up there. But is that actually what the Bible tells us glory looks like for humans? When we anticipate glory to come, right, we cross that threshold, death comes, and we enter into the presence of God, is it, number one, is that when we enter into glory? And is that glory someplace out there with God? And is it this visible manifestation of light? Does the Bible actually affirm those presuppositions that we have in our mind? Thanks to ancient writers, ancient painters, thanks to people like um, John Newman, Amazing Grace, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. But is that what the Bible says? So that's where we're going, okay? In order to do that, we're going to start with the Old Testament. Tomorrow, we're going to go into the New Testament, so hold on. Tonight's going to be a little bit harder. I'm going to work you a little bit, but it's for the good of it, okay? So we're going to go back to the beginning, literally, Genesis chapter 1. We're asking the question, why were we created? Why were we created? Let's go to the next slide. Purpose of humanity. Genesis 1, 26 to 28, a text that you all have read many times likely. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, over, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. For those of you who are familiar with the Westminster Shorter Catechism, does anyone remember what the purpose of humanity says? Can you say it more loudly for us all? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Thank you. Well done. (laughs) Is the Westminster Confession, Shorter Catechism, is that description of the purpose of humanity in alignment with the most clear biblical text for why we are created? Yeah, maybe theologically, philosophically on some level, but at the same time, the text gives us a fairly explicit answer to our question that doesn't take as much philosophizing or theologizing. According to this, we're made in the image of God, which is essentially to do what? To rule. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, everything that creeps on the ground. When we consider what the Garden of Eden was for the ancient Near Eastern world, for these Hebrew writers, they're depicting God living in this temple, right? The God lives in the temple, and who works the temple? The priest. I heard somebody whispering it. The priests work in the temple. That's one visual image that is going to be carried throughout the Old Testament that's launched with this text, this context in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The other side of this is also how is God primarily known throughout the Hebrew Bible? He is known as king. God is meant to be the king of Israel who will fight for them, who will lead them, who will provide for them if they will only worship him and him alone as their king. So when did God become king? Not when they asked for a new king, certainly. God was king of Israel from day one of creation because God is king of all creation. And if God is king of all creation, then what does that make the created realm? His kingdom. Great. So we've got two images that we work with throughout the Hebrew Bible. One, the Garden of Eden in this context of Genesis is God as the spiritual ruler creator of the world. There are humans, you and I, who are created to be priests and to worship God and also intercede for the creation to God. That's what a priest or a pastor does, right? But then also, in terms of that kingship monarchy metaphor, what do humans do? They rule. They serve as God's vice regents, his vice rulers. Rule over the fish in the sea, birds in the air, everything that creeps have dominion over these things. Not as the utmost authority over all creation, because that, of course, is God. But God grants humanity the position of power to rule on his behalf, as his representatives. According to this text, this is why we are created. You and I, this is our purpose. Yes, there are many more things that we can say about what it means to be made in the image of God. Yes, we're emotional. Yes, we're rational. Yes, we're relational. We are moral. We are all the things, all the suggestions that have ever been brought up throughout history. But if we want to know what the Hebrew writers, the original authors of this, were trying to get at, we should look to the text that they wrote for us. To be made in the image of God is to have dominion on the earth. So let's go to the next slide then. The next thing we go to then is Psalm 8, a psalm I'm guessing you've heard many times. Here's Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
You've set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Here's key verse. You've made them to be a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This psalm is written by somebody who is contemplating why God, the creator of the universe, would look at you and I and actually think that we are worthy of being given a responsibility like this. Who are we, humanity, where by Genesis 6, every heart is only evil all the time, and God regretted that he had made them. How is it that you, creator God, look at us and deem us worthy of having this responsibility? to rule over your creation. So what's happening in Psalm 8 here is the psalmist is writing a commentary on Genesis 1. Or maybe Genesis 1 was written much after this. Who knows? Either way, one of them was originally written to describe the fact that God creates you and I and puts us in a position of glory and honor, crowned with glory and honor, given a position of dominion to rule over the created realm of God. So again, using that metaphor, God is king, and within his kingdom, he has given special privileges to humanity to rule over it on his behalf. That's you and I. We are crowned with glory and honor. We're called to represent God, the creator God, to everything that he has made. That's me representing God to you, you representing God to me, and us together representing God to the non-human created earth and cosmos. That's the purpose of our existence. Okay? At least according to the Hebrew Bible. Now, as we go forward, we look how this word glory gets used throughout the Hebrew Bible, okay? So here's where the hard work actually begins, the things that we try to skip over. It's a bit like reading Leviticus at times, yeah, or some genealogies. We think, oh, that's nice, and then how much more pages of this do we have? Let's just, oh, let's get to a story that we understand. We jump there. We can't do that. We can't do that because it's in those texts that the meat of actually what we need to be learning is found. Okay, so we have to do the hard work if we want to talk about the fun things. So um, I'm going to try and make it easy for you. Um, So let's go to the next slide. Two words for you. One is doxa, you'll hear me say. This is the Greek word for glory. And doxadzo the Greek word for the verb form to glorify. So throughout the Hebrew Bible, no, throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, I trace the Greek word glory and the Greek word for glorify, okay? And this right here is a summary of what I'm gonna show you next, kind of like a sandwich. You get the bread first, then the meat, and then a sandwich, and kind of cold them together. So glory or honor as honor or status associated with character, power, and wealth. In other words, when glory is used in the Old Testament, it's used to refer to these things. An honor or status associated with character, power, or wealth. Glory is used for God himself as a title. And as splendor or beauty, not symbolizing a sense of honor or status. The flowers have glory, right? They have beauty. The rainbow has glory. The rainbow is beautiful. It's splendid. 
Okay, and then the verb form to glorify means giving or according a status of honor, power, or authority. Very similar to the, the noun, but then also as making radiant, splendid, or beautiful. And here's where it's going to become tricky for us. Okay, so this is where we're going. Okay, so the next slide. Don't, don't freak out, it's okay. You, you do not need to understand anything here other than where you see large chunks of texts and where there are fewer chunks of texts. So what I have here is a little table and all those numbers are every single verse in the Old Testament where the word glory is used only for God. Every single time the word glory is used for God and which category it fits into. And the categories are glory as a title for God and then glory as honor, status, power, character. Sometimes it's given to God in inscription, right? Glory to you, most you know, uh, amazing creator. Um, the glory that God possesses, God, your glory is magnificent. Manifested in signs or symbols, um, actions associated with salvation, redemption, judgment. So the glory of God comes on the Canaanites and in thunder and lightning, and the glory of God descends and, you know, does whatever, right? So it's manifested in these powerful symbols, and then manifested in theophany, and that more is referring to the idea of the glory of God descends into the Holy of Holies, when Solomon dedicates the temple, or when Moses sees, is revealed God's glory, right? Theophany, so those are the times when glory is used for God in the Old Testament. And what you see is that it's fairly even, yeah, throughout, a little bit less for a title for God, but generally speaking, they, they, it's quite balanced. Okay, so the next slide then is the same idea, but this is now for people, for nations, and for objects. And... We've got glory as honor, status, character, wealth, possessions, and then glory as splendor or beauty. That one's a little bit harder to see. Glory as splendor or beauty, not symbolizing honor or status. So again, that's where the flowers have glory. What do you notice, though, for people? There's a lot and there's non-existence. In our Christian presuppositions, glory for people is almost always going to be symbolized by splendor or radiance. But never in the Old Testament are human beings given glory such that they are made to shine. Okay? Nations, objects, you see it all very similar. So, a few um, examples here then. Uh, or no, let's, do, let's go to the next one. So those were the, the noun form of glory. And now the verb, to glorify. And I've put them all together. Somehow God didn't show up there, but it's God, people, um, nations, and then objects. All very similar. So again, to glorify. God is glorified. We praise him. That's the majority of the ways that God is glorified. All praise and glory be to God. May God be glorified. We, we, give, we exalt him. We praise him. That's the majority of the ways that it's used. For people, though, notice that it's, again, a similar idea that the majority of the time when glorify is used, it's used as a sense of, showing or giving, receiving honor, an exalted status or wealth and positions, possessions, having nothing to do with bright shining lights. This is the main takeaway. Bright shining lights does not exist for humans in the Old Testament. Ah, but you say, but what about Moses, of course. Yep, okay, hold on to that thought. We'll get to him in a second. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Here are some examples which are indicative of how this gets used for humans in the Old Testament. So, 
The king glorified him and enlisted him among his first friends and made him general and provincial governor. So he glorified him. He made him governor. He exalted him to a position of honor or power. The second one there, after these things, King Artaxerxes glorified Haman, son of Hamadathos, and exalted him and set him above all his friends. He glorified him by putting him in a position of power and authority. The lower left there, for the Lord has glorified father over children, and he has confirmed a mother's judgment over sons. Again, it's a sense of authority and honor. Upper right, Isaiah 55, nations that did not know you shall call upon you, and peoples that do not understand you shall flee to you for refuge for the sake of your God, the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Israel, as a nation, is glorified. They have been given this sense of privilege, of honor. And then Daniel, in every topic and understanding and education which the king inquired of them, he took them to be ten times wiser, surpassing the servants and scholars that were in the whole kingdom. And the king glorified them and appointed them in affairs in his whole kingdom. Right? Daniel and his three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they all demonstrate that they are wiser and more capable than any of the other peoples in the king's court, and he puts them in positions of honor, of rule, of power. This is how humans are glorified in the Old Testament. Okay, so let's go back to that question of shining, though, because Moses won't go away. Let's go to the next slide. What do we do about Moses and his shining? Exodus, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone. In the text, it was literally that he was glorified because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin on his face shone, was glorified, and they were afraid to come near him. If we were to, of this one example of a human being glorified such that they are made to shine, what should be our takeaway for us, you and I? If it's going to be a one-to-one, what ought we to expect for our own glorification? Number one, it's only your face. Right? He had to put a veil on over his face. His whole body wasn't enraptured in this bright, shining light coming down off the mountain. Whatever was going on in this scene, it was only his face. So if, and that's a very large if, we are to make this the indicative example of what it looks like for you and I to be glorified someday when we die, then it's only going to be our face. But I would suggest that even that sense of shining reveals something larger, okay? There's other places where shining becomes important. We can go to the next slide. In the book of Daniel, um, we usually stop reading by this point. We, we get to Daniel chapter 7 or 8, and then we're kind of done, and then it's history that we're not familiar with, and it's hard to read, and so we skip to the next book. Um, Daniel chapter 12 is very important. 12 verse 1, At that hour, Michael, the great angel who stands over the sons of your people, will pass by. That is a day of affliction, which will be such as has not occurred since they were born until that day. And on that day, the whole people will be exalted, whoever is found inscribed in the book. And many of those who sleep in the flat of the earth will arise, some to everlasting life, but others to shame and others to dispersion and contempt everlasting. And those who are intelligent, note that, will shine or will be glorified like the luminaries or the stars of heaven, and those who strengthen my words will be as the stars of heaven forever and ever. Okay, so here is one more place where the writer does talk about how Someday, when those who are dead have perished, will rise to new life, and they will be made to shine like the stars. 
Okay, if that's the foundation of all of our presuppositions about shining, okay, number one, it's only the intelligent. We have major theological issues with that, correct? <laughs> I hope so. But number two, the larger biblical narrative about the role of stars has to come into play. So let's go to the next one. What does it mean to shine like the stars? Okay, number one, we're shining like the stars, not God in this concept. But number two, the brilliance of the luminaries is associated with their rule. They shine because they are ruling. The first one there is Enoch, which is a Jewish text that would have been written sometime between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. Okay? You shall be given authority upon the sinners, such authority as you may wish to have. A bright light shall enlighten you. Again in one Enoch, in order that they, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the created objects which circulate in all the chariots of heaven should rule in the face of the sky and be seen on the earth to be guides for the day and the night. So Enoch talks about the sun, moon, and stars ruling in the sky. Psalm 135, the sun to have authority over the day because his mercy is forever, the moon and the stars to have authority over the night because his mercy is forever. And perhaps most importantly for us, only because of familiarity, Genesis 1.16, and God made the two great luminaries, the great luminary for rulership of the day and the lesser luminary, the rulership of the night, which are the stars. In other words, in this context of Genesis 1, when God is creating all things, he creates humanity, you and I, to rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, everything that creeps on the ground. He creates the sun to rule over or to govern the day and the sun, excuse me, the, the moon and the stars to rule over the night. Within this context of creation, it's about rulership. It's about power or authority. So to connect this back to this question, if we're going to shine like the stars, okay, that only means that we are ruling. We are doing what the writer of Genesis tells us we are meant to be doing from the very beginning. Or what the psalmist in Psalm 8 tells us we were created for. To be crowned with glory and honor and to rule over the things that God has created, representing God to the rest of his creation and also then serving as priests who intercede between God and his creation. We'll talk more tomorrow about how God establishes Israel to be a kingdom of priests and how those two things are meant to go together for these people to live as God's agents within the world. Okay, so for tonight, um, we can go to the next slide. Here's what we've done. When glory and glorify are used with regard to humanity in the Old Testament, the terms primarily refer to or are associated with the concepts of honor, power, wealth, and authority that come with an exalted status. This is how we should understand Psalm 8 when the psalmist writes that humanity is crowned with glory and honor and given dominion over all things. And therefore, this is how we should understand what the writer of Genesis 1 means when he writes that God made humanity in the image of God and gave them dominion over all things. And finally, this is the biblical background to Paul's declaration, because where are we going? Romans 8:30. Paul's declaration that believers have a hope of glory and are glorified. Remember Romans 8.30, those whom he um, called, he predestined, those he predestined, he justified, those he justified, he glorified. Climax of Romans. The hope that we all have to be conformed to the image of the Son, which is to say, to be glorified. 
Well, if this is the context upon Paul, which Paul is drawing for his Jewish theology within a Roman empire in which glory only means authority, power, and rule, then just perhaps Paul's understanding this glory as the purpose of humanity at creation, which must inform our understanding of the redemption of humanity at the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you want to know what the goal of salvation is, you first have to have a sense of what the gospel is. What was it that Jesus was doing on that cross? And if our glorification is the goal of salvation that Jesus was somehow accomplishing, how do those two things go together? What does the cross have to say to our glorification? So that's where I'm going to leave you for tonight. Um, yeah. Um, so I think with that then, it's time to do Q&A or whatever. Uh, I'll let you take it away. Um, golly, my Ugh. goodness. Well done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the, the, one, the one that I've got to get to right away, thank you. So glory is rulership, is dominion, is power, is authority. Um, is, there, is there room in the text... As we think about the nature of the earth these days and creation care, et cetera, and so arguably our interpretation of um, our role as human beings on the face of the earth has been dominion, subduing, et cetera, yeah. but of late, theologians, Bible scholars have come to us and said, you know, in this subordination, subduing, dominion, rulership, there's also responsibility mm. that, that a ruler, a good king, a good queen, a ruler, they are simply not given the power to do whatever they want. They have some sense of responsibility for their people. Um, discuss that with me as you think about glory and ruler and dominion. Is, it, is there responsibility? Is there stewardship? Um, as we think of Genesis stories, et cetera, and the creation and creation care in these days, um, all that's going on with the earth. Now talk about dominion yeah. subduing all of that, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and 100%, that's all there. It has to be. It's one of the greatest oversights, I think, to the regret of, I mean, the, the, the church, that we, have, that we have read a text for so long in which we think this dominion that we have means that we get to use it however we want, yeah. right? Um, historically, and, and you made mention of how more recently we've, we've begun changing our thoughts about these things. <clears throat> historically, it's been the, the, the assumption that we are given dominion and it's for us and we will, we will mine it, we will extract it, we will pollute it, we will do whatever because it's ours to do with as we fit, see fitting. Um, and of course, that mindset has started to change but at the same time, even as that mindset has changed, and I think even within the church, the mindset has still been, okay, yes, we should take care of the earth, we should preserve you know, these, these things, we should, um, we should make sure our pollution is, is not so high that it's to the detriment of the trees and oxygen output, you know, emissions, like all that conversation. But even within that, I find it striking how, at the end of the day, it's still an understanding that it's there for us. Yes. We're keeping it safe so that it can continue to preserve us. Yes. That it, life, it, will, it will continue to yeah, keep our lifestyle going. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out, you know, this is just the language that gets used, we need to figure out what that right number of emissions is so that we don't let things continue to get worse, but maintain what it is but still allowing that own our the way of life that we have created to exist. Yes. Well said. But within that, then it's the understanding that creation has been created for our benefit, mm -hmm. and actually, what the text says, if anything, it's quite the opposite—that mm -hmm. we are created for its 
benefit. If you think God has created the entire cosmos, right? In Genesis 1, he looked and he said what? It is good. And he looked and he said it is good over and over and over. And of course, day six with humanity, he looked and he said it is very good. Very good. He takes the man, puts him in the garden to work it. I can't imagine that God is putting the man in the garden to be able to exploit it or extract from it something that's going to be to his benefit, but rather to have this mutual relationship where he's there to work the garden, to serve it, to do such, to give of himself such that it's allowed to thrive. So the weeds are taken away because they take the nutrients from the trees. The, you know, whatever is happening, he's there to work it, to help it, to produce, because that's what it's designed to do, because that's why it's good. It doesn't make it good that it produces for humanity. It's good because it produces. It does what God designed it to do. It was beautiful before humanity was created. It produced before humanity ever needed it. So if anything within this, this relationship, it's we are created for the benefit of the cosmos, of God's created world. And of course, that's non-human creation, but that also includes you and I within that created order. I'm created for your benefit. I'm created to help you thrive. I'm created to help you know better who God is and what he's done for you. And you are created to do that for me. And together, we are meant to be the people by whom or through whom God allows the non-human creation to flourish. Why is Sabbath such an important day? Because God was tired. (laughs) He was fatigued. He said, oh, I'm so exhausted. I just need a long lie in my hammock. If I could just have a day. Of course not, right? And we know this. Um, There's a a brilliant scholar um, by the name of Kristen Dee Dee Johnson, and she has um, a a beautiful book where she describes um, justice and kind of justice throughout the biblical order Um, and one of the most insightful ideas I've ever heard about Sabbath comes from her, and so I want to give her credit for this. She challenged um, me and everyone in this book to think more deeply about why Sabbath is actually important. Yes, it's to rest, and yes, it's to recognize God provides for us. Yes, it's to recognize we can't do it on our own. God doesn't need us. All the things that we're we're used to talking about, but um, who, it's a question of who doesn't get Sabbath, mm. right? Like you and I, I think probably everyone in the room, we all get a Sabbath. And I don't just mean like taking a day off of work. Sabbath is the day that we're meant to remember the beauty and the sheer goodness of creation, where there was flourishing, there was shalom, right? Peace. There was mishpat, righteousness, mm. Sarika, uh, you know, um, justice and righteousness. Um, these things were there at creation. And those are the things that got marred in Genesis 3 when sin and death entered. When did racism begin? Genesis 3. When did corruption of the, the created earth happen? Genesis 3. When did murder happen? Yeah, Genesis 4, technically, yeah. but the possibility for it was Genesis 3. War, famine, diseases, misogyny, abuse. Every single thing that's evil that we can think of was launched in Genesis 3. And before that, evil didn't exist. Everything that existed was beautiful and perfect and good. So why Sabbath? Why seventh day of resting and reflecting? 
It's that sense of remembering what created order was at the beginning. So when you think, okay, who doesn't get a Sabbath? It's the person who is caught in a cycle or an abusive relationship. Mm-hmm. It's the, the child who's a um, slave in a factory in Thailand. Mm. It's the mother in Yemen who's watching her child die of starvation, literally right now, right? Mm. These are the people who do not get a Sabbath, a day when they can just remember the goodness of creation and and bask in the sense of all that they have and the goodness of their life because their life isn't good in the way that it was meant to be. So absolutely, that sense of that relationship that was there at the beginning and what does it mean to rule? It means to be there as God's representatives helping things to flourish and maintain that initial sense of goodness that we've just lost in our culture. Thank you, thank you. That helps expand my understanding, my thinking then of what glory means if we are being lifted up, crowned for God's glory. Um, Let me play with this. So um, I want to... I'm thinking about the theophany category. One of my favorite theophanies, of course, um, is um, in Exodus where, where Moses asks God to show me your glory. Mm-hmm. And then God says, you can't see me because you're a human being and I'm God. And so God says, tuck away over there and then I'll walk past you and then you can see. And so it's different interpretations, God's backside or whatever. That's all you can see of God's glory. Why mm-hmm. do you, what does it mean that that, that question of what, what, what is it to ask God, show me your glory? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, can I ask a reverse question? Yes, you can. What does it mean when the psalmist writes, the heavens declare the glory, glory of God? Of God. Mm. Does it mean that literally the heavens somehow say, look at the brightness of God? <laughs> When the psalmist writes, the heavens declare the glory of God, what are they declaring? They're declaring his power, his creation, his magnificence, his authority, the fact that he is the creator God. Could it be the fact that he is the gracious and compassionate God who's slow Mm. to anger, rich Mm. in love? Mm. What does it mean for the heavens to declare the glory of God? So the glory of God becomes this term then or this phrase that captures all of these things i think there's a way for all of that to be caught up in the theophany Hmm. that moses witnesses there's a visual there is that light i'm not suggesting that 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 doesn't exist Mm -hmm. that god doesn't have that Um, but rather that that points to something else So the glory of God descending into the holy of holies. Is it just there's this sense of bright light there? No, that bright light is about the only thing that the writer can imagine that communicates that this is the creator, God of the universe, who's now in their midst. And if you have a God who doesn't have a physical body, how else are you going to communicate that you can see them. Mm. That's really the only way to do it Mm -hmm. that I can think of. But it's, again, not the significance that the writer says that God has this visible glory that Moses can see or the glory that inhabits the Holy of Holies, but rather what that glorious appearance is speaking to, what it's representing. And it's representing the truest identity of God. Mm the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who spoke creation into being. How else can you represent a physical, not a physical, a visible manifestation of that God? So, I mean, I don't know, other than to think um, symbolically, that's all they have to work with for us to see something. But who cares about the bright light? It's who that God is that is being 
represented mm. by that light, mm. which I think is why when Moses comes down off the mountain and his face is reflecting it, we don't care about the bright light. It's the fact that he has just encountered the holy God of creation who formed him, yes. who made that mountain, yes. who has called Israel into being, who has just taken them through the Red Sea, who just decimated Pharaoh in Egypt, right? That's the God that Moses has just been communing with. I think if any of us were literally on the mountain with God, we all might have shining faces. Mm -hmm. But it's, again, about who that God is that we are now called to represent, right? Then Moses goes down the mountain, and of course he becomes the leader of Israel. He's going to become the person who is the figurehead of the Mosaic Covenant and the law, who Israel is going to become, the people of God known throughout the world. Um, but that's what that face is, is it representing. Is. It is, it is, it is. So, it is. Yeah. so that's where I wanted to go next, and you took me there beautifully. So, so Moses comes down the mountain, He's shining because of his encounter. Mm. Would you say that it's all right for me to think the heavens declare the glory of God if I take glory, Moses' encounter with God, yearning to see God, asking God, show me your glory. Um, I wonder if glory is relationship. Mm. Heavens declare the relationship of God to all of creation. When Moses says, show me your glory, O God, I think Moses is asking for a relationship with God, an encounter with God, and then Moses manifests that when he comes down the mountain. I think when, when we are crowned for glory, I wonder if we are being crowned for relationship, for how God yearns for relationship with humankind and all of creation, and yearns for us to be in relationship, right relationship with one another, with mm -hmm. all of humankind. How does that sound to you? Power, dominion, rule, um, relationship. It sounds nice. <laughs> I got a nice. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacob. It sounds like a very kind and loving thought. Oh. I, <laughs> um, Rats. The trouble, the trouble is, would we ever say mm. Queen Elizabeth was crowned for relationship? On one level, yes, as humans, sure, sure. she needs to be in right relationship with her subjects. Yes in order for any of that to work. Yes. But that's a, that's a you know, kind of um, consequence or, or side element of what actually being crowned means. Hmm. I, in other words, I don't think that they're synonymous. Okay. Um, it's, it's part of it, yes. but s being crowned isn't synonymous with being in a relationship. Right. Being crowned is synonymous with having power. And how you use that power in relationships is going to determine what your power looks like, right? And what your reign looks like. Um, I would say, too, and part of what I try to do is distinguish between the glory of God mm -hmm. and the glory of humans, mm -hmm. right? So the way that, and we see, that's why I like those, you know, the overwhelming kind of tables that have all the texts, because you can see that when glory is used for God, it's used in many different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. The issue is that it's not used in many different ways for humans. Sure. And that's the part that I try to challenge to say, um, we try to use glory in the same way that it's used for God in our own kind of Christian yeah. thinking, yeah. and that's just not allowable mm -hmm. if we're going to do good biblical work. Mm. So is right relationship part of the conversation? Absolutely. What I think Moses is saying when Moses says to God, show me your glory, that he's saying, you know, show me relationship or be in relationship with me. I would say God living in relationship with people is a part of his glory. In the same way, right, that some of those other things that he is gracious and compassionate, slow mm -hmm. to anger, mm -hmm. rich in love, that's part of his glory. Mm -hmm. That's part of his character. It's who he is. To be in relationship is part of his character. Mm -hmm. It's part of who he is, mm -hmm. as we know in the Godhead. Um, I don't personally see any reason to think that's specifically what Moses would be asking mm -hmm. for, though, other than it sounds really nice as we think about our own relationships with God. Yes, yes, good point. So, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, the one more. Think about with me. Um, 
Fear of the Lord, awe, mm. wonder in terms of glory. How do yeah. you parse fear of the Lord, awe, wonder, and God's glory? Uh, fear, awe, and wonder are, I would guess, the, the only right responses to God's glory. Mm. Um, if we truly understand what the glory of God is, we can only be in awe where we can only be in fear. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, Moses understood that, um, yeah, various kings understood that, not many. <laughs> <laughs> um, but right, some here and there, Josiah, um, right, when we truly recognize who God is, w amazement, mm -hmm. awe, in the truest sense of the word, can only be the right response. Mm. Um, if we don't have that response, we might be imagining God in our own image, uh, yeah. right? Yes, well said. Yeah. Kate, thank you, Gus. <laughs> oh, good point. Say, so if there's New Testament, we should keep them for tomorrow. Mm, nice. So then how do you justify the rule of dictators? For instance, Putin, et cetera. <laughs> um, I don't yes, justify Yes, I was going to say, that's, that would be mine too. Um, God puts people in power, but how we use that oh, is wow. up to us, either to the glory of God or to the demise of ourselves, the honor of ourselves, idolatry, yeah. We're all given power. And going back to that question of creation, it's how we use it that determines who we're going to be as God's representatives. Mm, mm, nice. I was intrigued also in your screenshot, not only, of course, with the prevalence of light, but did you see when they had a human figure? There was a, yes, it was this common posture uh -huh. of the human. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Which I think is meant to be I do too. a recognition of praise. You know, oh, you, you see a sunset, right? Oh, wow, look at that. Or, you know, just our general praise God, right? When, we, when we're doing this, when we're praising God in worship, we are reflecting on the glory of God. We might not think that or use those words, but it's who we understand God to be in all his fullness that we are praising, admiring, lauding. And that's just a natural position of, of praise and worship. It so, is, it yeah. is, it is. Intrigued me too, just to see yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, is the talk about heavens, um, stars, luminaries, ruling, declaring the glory, is it related to astrology? Movements of heavenly bodies rule over us? Um, are these passages the source of Christian astrology? Have they been used that way at all? There's a lot there. Um, I, I will honestly say I don't know. I, I have done very little with astrology and um, um, Judeo-Christian mm. foundations for that. I want to say there's not much. It, there might be for astrology. They might be taking things for that, mm -hmm. but it's not going to work the other way. right? The, the writers of the Old Testament are not going to take um, astrology from you know the second millennium bc and weave it into these texts mm. um you could think of something like so one of the other things to say is i don't know if the word apocalyptic means anything to you yeah. hopefully you don't think zombies uh, my students do <laughs> when i when i ask them to think about apocalyptic texts or you know the, the apocalypse they think of these films that have come out in the last 15 20 years that all have zombies and you know they're kind of end of the world films um but then i tell them actually you know the ap apocalyptic literature is a style of literature that was created by early jews in the time period between the end of the old testament and the beginning of the new that's when judaism arose as a religion it came out of ancient israelite traditions and customs and early Jewish writers wrote Jewish mystical texts or Jewish apocalyptic texts. And what that was essentially is kind of code language writing where they had this sense of evil in the world 
and God, of course, being on the side of good, but they have the question, God, where are you? God, are you fighting our battles for us? Because if you are, it doesn't look like you're winning. (laughs) And these texts were written to say, number one, God is winning. They have one thing in common, which is always God is on the throne. Mm. So if you can think of a text in your own Bible that we think of as apocalyptic and God is on the throne, the first one that should come to mind is Revelation. Mm. Revelation is an apocalyptic text written not by a Jew, but a Jewish Christian, John. God is on the throne. And the question that's being asked is, who's winning the battle? And the answer is God. He is on the throne. Mm. The battle that's taking place is between God and evil spiritual powers. And so the battle that gets big gets depicted then is about that but that originates with first century bc second century bc judaism where they write these apocalyptic texts and in those texts then they've got spiritual forces waging battle against god there's angels going back and forth serving as messengers shining lights in the skies like it's this whole kind of mystical world that they are the spiritual world that they are describing. It would be also Daniel, right? Daniel is an apocalyptic text. Daniel has these visions. Daniel 7, Daniel has the vision of the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days, who is seated at the throne, and the book is open, and he's ready to hold court. And of course, then, he gives glory and honor and dominion and power to the Son of Man for all eternity. Hugely important Old Testament text for Mm. the New Testament writers. Mm. That would be an apocalyptic text where he has this vision, right? He's just had these vision of these creatures, these monsters coming up out of the sea. One looks like a bear, a lion, right? They're visions, about these political, spiritual empires that are waging war against God. And the question is, God, who's in charge? Mm. And the answer is, God is, he's on the throne, he will win the battle. And within those contexts, stars, lights, luminaries in general, they're all part of this mystical language. Mm. So long-winded answer to the question of, you know, astrology, astrology, um, what's feeding into what, that's definitely coming out of um, Hebrew, uh, early Jewish mystical writings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Jacob, thank you. We are so glad you are here. We're looking forward to the morning. You've given us much to think about, and we'll give more in the morning. We're very grateful.